Hey, 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 good morning, one and all. We are back in the studio having a good time already. You were watching us before we went on the air. We saw you, those on Facebook Live, having a good time before, having a good time right now. And we say a pleasant good morning. Welcome to Garden America. I'm Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco. We're all here today for the next, uh, not quite two hours, but close to it. Those on BizTalk Radio, we welcome you. Thank you for tuning in to last week's show. Unlike the last a week or so, we do have a guest lined up today, which we'll talk about. But in the meantime, I want to find out if John's computer is charging. It is. It is now. You're good? You're good to yep, go? I am. I'm looking at the screen here. I feel I... uncomfortable when my computer is not charging because that means the battery is draining. If it goes out in the middle of the show, I'm just totally lost. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Yeah, but we still love you whether you're lost or not. <laughs> and I'm looking at my computer screen, and I'm looking at all the people who are watching us. Mm -hmm. Darn you people look good. Right? We, we have some good-looking viewers. Good audience. Yeah, but have. even... Uh, I don't want to say it. <laughs> did you filter yourself? Huh? Did you just filter yourself? Yes, I did. See, we have no delay, unlike radio. There's a seven-second delay. Right. If we say it and it goes out on Facebook, two things can probably happen. Nothing, or they kick us off. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, we we'll get complaints. see. We'll see, huh? And, and, and we welcome you to the show. Go ahead, Tom. And unlike radio, they can see us, too. So yes. even, even, when yeah, we're, right, huh? even when we're trying not to say something, they still see what we're saying. And you know, every week my closed captions come on, even though I turn them off. Really? Oh, you know what? Mine are on too. Yeah, Let that... me turn those off right now. <laughs> you guys are funny. Oh, uh, what a what a crazy week. Okay. What weird crazy weather we in had. Your world how? Well, a it was what in the nineties, John? Right? I was up in Temecula. We it was in, in the nineties. Yeah, high eighties in Fallbrook, like eighty-eight. Yes. For like four days in a row, right? I felt midsummer, and then it didn't even cool down at night, which was also right. super interesting because normally during this time of year, I get it, it'll get warm during the day, but at night, you still need to throw a sweater on. I went out to a dinner with Janine, and I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt out yeah. to dinner at night. You know, I took yesterday off, and it was beautiful yesterday. I walked outside, and I'm like, this is nice. Yeah. Now it's going to get cold and rain again, Well, right? I was going to say, and now driving in yesterday to work and driving in today there's fog and then they're supposed to say rain monday. tonight oh is it monday. sunday to monday or right. something yeah i don't know what the chances are yeah it's, really it's been it says a hundred percent chance on doesn't a monday a hundred percent says a hundred percent but that can change yeah so Nothing's i mean ever a hundred percent but i mean that's just now, tanya up in uh, so quick. san jose says rain expected up there monday and it always so, moved. It always moves down the coast because right. last week we had somebody say, "Well, it's raining here already," and then by Monday or Tuesday it rained here in San Diego. Yeah. So yeah, what a what a crazy, weird week with um, the weather. Yeah. But then you know, the 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 fun thing about San Diego though is like I mentioned, when summer when we get that summertime weather, the <clears throat> the environment changes here where people are just out. Yeah. And they're they're doing things, and we have longer days. So in you know we're I was coaching Isaac soccer, and at seven o'clock at night, we're just at the park, right? Kicking and the soccer light, ball around. It's still it's light. Warm. You see those people out. But now this is always the big tease here in San Diego, because <laughs> around March, sometimes late February, we get this nice weather. People think, "Oh, summer's here," and then comes April and May, and it gets cold again. Yeah. So don't be lured into that false sense of weather security. And yeah. I've said that for years, Tiger. And John Indeed. knows that I've said that for years. I think this <laughs> it's is my, documented. This is my ninth year of saying that. Anyway, uh, somebody, this is interesting. Uh, somebody on Facebook, Tony says, "Can I ask John a question?" Yes. Well, Tony wants to know how the lemon chiffon. This is Tony from Connecticut. From Connecticut, yes. Welcome, Connecticut, Tony. Yes, she wants to know how the lemon chiffon cuttings are doing, and I think of Tony probably once every two weeks because they did not fare well. And I need to get some again, but I'm going to try to have it budded this year. Um, did not work. I think she might have the last lemon chiffon rose in the world. Tony, have yep. you ever had any of the last thing in the world ever? <laughs> did that make sense? Have you ever had any of the last I, I don't thing mean, in no, the world ever? No, I'm not ever? sure. By the way, I mean, Kim and uh, at the uh, Tucson Backyard Garden uh, Club is watching, and her friend Carol. Hey, did Good you bring morning. Carol into the mix? Uh, we appreciate that. Yeah. Welcome, Tucson. Now, there's no front yard back or front yard club, is there, John? Just just a backyard club in Tucson. They only have the backyards. front yard club is a uh, 
different kind of club. It has nothing to do with gardening, and I don't really <laughs> want to get into what they do. And I think that's something only a certain segment of the population are into. That's right. But Tucson but, doesn't want to get grouped into that. <laughs> you know, Gina, who my daughter Gina, who's up in Idaho, uh, you know, we're talking about hot weather here. They've been in the 70s all what? week. Yeah. Really? That's like that, the 90s here. Yeah, that is that is midsummer for them. And, and then... It's nice probably for them, meaning, you know, in the yeah, summertime, right. it gets, you know, hot, really hot and, right? you know, for them. So this is like their ideal situation in the 70s. You know no what? bugs. And... I, I can't think of anything else right now because Tony said she's got two cuttings rooted uh, on the lemon chiffon. And she's going to send me one. What? Wow, it's, Tony. It's like, jeez, Tony. It's the happiest I've been in. God, I can't remember. His that. whole facial expression just just changed right just, there. Th this surpassed his uh, wedding day. The hey, kids, the, the day like his kids in, were born. What's the weather like in Connecticut? I wonder, Tony. Well, maybe she'll tell us. Yeah. So hey, we can, now, John. You didn't make much mention of this earlier, but when I drove in, and we come from the same, well, we come south to get to the station. The fog. So, what a fog! I mean, yeah. 50 feet ahead, people are driving like it's, you know. That's an indication the weather's going to change, right? Because we've had all that hot weather. Sure. And now the yeah. cool weather's coming in. But I was amazed at how fast people continue you know, to Tiger's drive in the fall. been talking fog. about 80s, 90-degree temperatures. The high on Monday in Fallbrook is going to be 59. What? Yeah. Freezing. <laughs> Tony says well, Sunday is cool, snow but there. expecting 30s next week. What? Yeah. 30s. Back to the 30s. Oh, my goodness. So you know, I've, I think I've told you this before, but. I decided to leave Michigan when I had a uh, a tree wisteria. You had that, tree hysteria? No, wis wisteria. Okay, all right. That I waited ten years for it to bloom. I had it planted in it was actually in my parents' backyard, and <clears throat> this uh, after ten years, the whole thing was covered with buds. Got about, they were about an inch to two inches long. So you're excited now, right? So I was excited, sure. like, yeah, we're going to have this wisteria blooming. A freeze came in the middle of May and just killed everybody. You wiped out it. a decade of and anticipation? I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> I just can't take this wow. anymore. Yeah, that's got to be tough. I know. Because I've never lived anywhere so cold that I couldn't garden all year. So I can sympathize with you, but don't well, really both get it. Uh, both my son Joe and my daughter Gina have moved to cold climates, and they're excited because of the different things they can grow. You know, yeah. Gina says, you know, I've got peonies coming up right now, but I don't know if either one has ex experienced the heartbreak of that, like I was just discussing, where yeah. things come out and then they right. just flat out freeze. But, send send, but it, send but it Gina is... a plumeria plant see what she does with that. <laughs> Well, she was talking about, uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to figure out if I can keep rosemary over the winter. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough as nails for us right. still over there. And then she was talking about uh, cutting her clematis back too far and thought she had cut all the blooms off. And she goes, you know what, maybe last year I put a mandevilla there, diplodenia, <laughs> and the diplodenia did great. But she said everybody up there plants them as annuals. Right. Because they're not going to live over You're the winter. You're nothing but a diplodenia. <laughs> hey, let's say uh, we got a couple of minutes. Who put the dip in the dip diplodenia? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> a couple of minutes till our break, Tiger. Let's uh, let's talk about who our upcoming guest will be after the break on the other side. So we have Eric Keller, a uh, author and therapist, going to be joining us this morning. He wrote a book called the A Therapist Garden, and so we're going to be talking about how um, he is a horticultural therapist. So using gardening as therapy. And so in his book, it's real life situations that he's experienced that he created and compiled and put into this book that kind of lays out the uh, framework for using gardening as therapy. So he would say to you, you go to see this guy, I want you to go home. I want you to plant two tomato plants, a rose <laughs> and a camellia and call me in the morning. Exactly. Exactly that. So, you know, Geez, Brian, why do we even have to have him on if you already know exactly what's going to happen? These are some of the yeah. things that we're going to be finding out. <laughs> Once I got over a thousand roses, my family to told me I needed help. You, yeah, so exactly. So I'm glad we're going to be talking to this guy. And and John, since John hit a thousand, and they said he needed help, he just kept going. 
Right. Well, if I need help now, what's another 500 going to matter? Yeah. <laughs> what's another 1,000? Uh, what's another one from Tony going to mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. That one I need, though. Hey, um, do we have time for the quote of the week? We've got time. We've got exactly a minute, John. Sure. All right. This quote is from your buddy, Montague Don. Remember Monty? Monty, too, isn't it? Monty Don. Monty Don? Yeah. Is this a, is a long He's like quote? our uh, British counterpart. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's uh, Garden England <laughs> instead of Garden America. Anyway, um, I put this quote because it reminded me of myself. And I didn't think, speaking of needing help, I didn't know there were other people like this. But he said, there's very few nights when I don't lie in the dark. Everyone else sleeping inside this creaking bony house and go through the garden, seeing it with the clarity of a dreamer, taking it to pieces and putting it together again. Mending everything in my head. Beautiful. That's, Something you have to think about. Really? At least I do. Yeah. The but bony, I mean, that's, creaking house? That's, I don't know if I've ever admitted it before, but that's the way I am every single night. Yeah. I never once go, rarely go to bed without thinking about changing something, something in the in garden. in the yard or something you're working on. On that note, we're going to bring our guest on. On the other side, that is. Going to take a uh, rather quick break on Facebook Live, a bit longer on BizTalk Radio. Welcome to your Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, depending upon where you are. This is Garden America, Brian Maine, John Bagnesco, Tiger Pelafox. Our guest is coming up next right here on Garden America. Stay with us. All right, we have returned from that uh, short break on Facebook Live, a bit longer on BizTalk Radio. Anyway, that said, thank you for tuning in this morning as we are ready to go on your weekend. Happy Saturday. Tiger Palafox, John Bagnesco, I'm Brian Maine. Our guest, Eric, is ready to go. Tiger, let's get into some therapy, shall we? <laughs> we, we, we know we all need it here. And uh, what a great guest we have lined up this morning. Eric Keller, the author of A Therapist's Garden. And Eric, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Eric, can you hear us? Okay, I can hear us from the background. Yeah. There was a little problem with him hearing me when I called him up. Let, let's uh, let's take two on this and see what we can do. Okay. Eric, can you hear uh, us? There could be a little technical difficulty on my side. How, do, do I sound okay? Yeah. yeah. You sound good. All right. Can you hear me now, Eric? Okay. Um, I think he's got the radio on in the background, which yeah. is going to yeah. mess him up. Hey, Eric. All right. How does it, how does it sound now? Perfect. That's better because you turned the radio off, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to do something through a headphone and a mic, but that's not working, so we'll just do it this way. Yeah, you sound right. good. You're loud and clear, so thank you for taking time this morning. Tiger? <laughs> so, Eric, um, you know, I just want to thank you very much for joining us this morning. You're the author of A Therapist Garden, Using Plants to Revitalize Your Spirit. Now, you know, the first question I, I have is, can you lay out for our listeners what a horticultural therapist is? Because that's kind of a uh, new term to me. Yeah, sure. Now, uh, you know, you're you're not really a you know kind of a plant whisperer. I mean, you don't go to uh, expensive locations uh, with people and talk to their sick plants and try to make them feel better because they feel inadequate that they're not growing tall enough. <laughs> but what you what you do is you use uh, plants as a piece of your your kind of therapeutic mechanism to deal with basically four different issues uh, that people or your clients can have. And those are uh, physical issues, uh, cognitive issues, social issues, and emotional issues. And so you do different things with plants, with different clients, depending upon uh, what their challenges are. And again, I've, uh, over the last 20 years, worked with a wide variety 
of folks ranging from girls in a juvenile detention center to seniors with dementia and physical problems. So the type of plants and what you do with each particular group really varies uh, quite a lot depending. And, you know, your your background, you know, this is something that you kind of discovered later, right, in your life, almost like when you were to the point of retirement, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've my every 10 years, I, I seem to swap something out except my wife. So, uh, you know, she's a, she's a long-term keeper. So, um, the, uh, the thing about me is that I was educated as an engineer. Uh, I became a journalist, then I became an analyst, then I became a consultant, and then I became a horticultural and horticultural therapist. So every 10 years of my life, I seem to have hopped into something different. Um, and, and what I love about horticulture, I'm sure you guys uh, you know, empathize with this is that, you know, you're learning something new every day. Every time you think you've got sort of a problem knocked or you know it all, uh, plants are there, nature is there to show you, uh, no, you really don't know it all. <laughs> Here's a <laughs> new, new twist we're going to throw your way. Yeah. And uh, when you have that and work with clients, it's just a wonderful experience. And, you know, in your book, you lay it out almost as a 12 month plan. And, and I have a question. Maybe just the answer is simply that January is the beginning of the year for most people. But is there a reason you started with January and worked to December? Or did you ever consider starting, you know, in the spring when I would say most people maybe think gardening starts? Yeah. Well, I, I did it for a couple of reasons. One is that sort of the year does begin in January. And what I wanted to do is that if you sort of look at some of the last stories in December, they're very matched to that in January. I, I also wanted to start in January to challenge people's assumptions about what you can and can't do in the winter weather in New England. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy and, you know, uh, sort of obvious to try to grow something in, um, uh, you know, in the spring or summer. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, if you're harvesting salads in January in New England when there's snow outside. <laughs> Very true. Um, well, you know, and then earlier you mentioned the different uh, therapies, and you had mentioned kind of a, a emotional therapy, uh, using gardening as an emotional therapy. And in, in the book, there's a story that um, I'm trying to refer back to it. There's a, uh, I think it's a young man, um, by the name of, um, where was it? Um, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the weeding out the anger and, okay. and you worked it and you picked up Peter. Okay. And you know, he was very frustrated and you brought him home and you guys worked on a, a weeding and brush clearing task and how, you know, you kind of utilize that hard job of kind of getting rid of some of the anger that he had. And, you know, I just thought it was kind of interesting because, you know, most people I think feel, you know, therapy or gardening is more of a calming or a relaxing, um, you know, real, real low level, you know, therapy where, you know, yeah, I mean, sometimes when you're chopping down a bush or, you know, taking off a tree limb, you know, that's could be more intense and, you know, it could get out bigger frustrations, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and what I was uh, telling Peter was to try to sort of transfer his, his anger and his, his energy from being sort of upset with life to, you know, sort of liberating the roots of uh, the mint and the other vines that we were pulling from the ground. And, you know, if any of you have ever tried to pull mint, uh, you know it's not a simple task. you got to really, you know, rip it away. And we also had some other brush there. So, I mean, he just... He just really got into it. He got a sweat going, and his whole disposition changed because rather than be sort of angry in the absence of anything physical, he was able to sort of you know transfer it to the physical effort of pulling stuff out of the ground and then looking at the accomplishment, which is, hey, we got this great empty plot of soil that now we can plant some great stuff into. Yeah, and, you know, that is one thing I feel with any kind of um, – gardening therapy you know because i kind of looked at it you know with, with my yard when i'm clearing out an area or weeding there's that there's that sense of accomplishment afterwards right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's it's you know i i think sometimes at least 
at least for me, when I'm doing something uh, very physical and it's it's difficult, you you almost want to transfer, you know, maybe not anger, but sort of you know intense energy into it. I I know that you know one of my favorite activities uh, when I am you know somewhat frustrated and want to sort of take it out is I go and split wood. Uh, you know, we heat our house or part of our house with uh, wood. And so every year we need between a cord and a half and two cords of wood. So, you know, if, if you sort of feel lousy and crummy going outside, and splitting some wood and being out in nature and working up a sweat and, you know, even in, in the cold weather, it's just, again, a sort of a, a great therapeutic uh, thing whereby, you know, rather than be upset to yourself or other people, you're sort of taking it out on this inanimate object. Hey, we're going to have to take a break here in just a, a few seconds. But when we get back from the break, I wanted to bring up a part of the book where, you know, you went and got some amaryllis. And, and you got these amaryllis from a discount store. And I just wanted to bring it up because it's also, you know, how people can do this no matter where you are. If you have a yard, if you don't have a yard, if you have money, you don't have money. So you, you kind of in this story, I kind of felt it kind of catered to everyone and specifically Brian, because Brian is a, a plant adopter where he doesn't buy any plants. He just adopts them all. So uh, when we get back, I want to kind of hit on that story. Um, again, we're talking with a Eric Keller, the author of A Therapist's Garden. And we thank you for tuning in. Now, do stay with us. We're up against the clock. We're going to take a break for BizTalk Radio. Back after these messages and a quicker break here on Facebook Live. Okay, we are back, and we do appreciate you uh, tuning in each and every Saturday, noticing that our viewership and uh, listenership is going up. So thank you so much for supporting Garden America and our many guests that we have here. I'm Brian Main. We've got Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco, Eric is with us. We're doing some plant therapy this morning, Tiger. Yeah, and we're not plant therapy on a uh, we're addicted to plants therapy. We're using gardening as a therapeutic way to deal with either kind of the emotional or physical problems that we may have. And Eric Keller is the author of A Therapist Garden and kind of guiding us through this process. And before the break, Eric, I had mentioned how there was one story about you being, you're doing a, a class at one of the facilities, the uh, Ann's place, and you had picked up some amaryllis. And I think they were on discount, maybe end of the season. And you were going to use them for guard for for a class later on, and I wanted to kind of um, bring the story because I think that most people think that oh I I don't have a yard or um, you know I don't have money to go buy plants, but this is something I kind of feel can that everyone can do right. Oh, every, everybody can can do even the tiniest little things. Uh, you know the the amaryllis class. I basically planned it almost a year in advance because I, I went to the supermarket on December 26 and they were clearing out all these amaryllises that were $10 a piece for a buck a piece. So I cleared out everything they had and I saved them in my basement. And then, you know, 11 and a half months later, I was able to use them for class. Uh, in terms of uh, having little things, uh, one of my most popular classes in the fall, in the winter, uh, is microgreens. Uh, you know, you can get a little tiny seeding tray and just seed it with uh, arugula, spinach, various greens, radishes, and have it by a window that doesn't even get great sun. And in two weeks, you can start cutting microgreens for your salad. So, I mean, there's just there's this countless things like that, that you can do, even in the tiniest of spaces. Yeah, and I mean, you know, in the book, you know, these lessons, these stories that you have, you connect them with, how the therapy works in. So it's not just about the gardening and then the amaryllis or the microgreens, but it's, you know, what do the microgreens do for the people during that situation? And these are all real life situations, right, Eric? Oh, absolutely. So, so with the microgreens, uh, it's a very popular class I do at Ann's Place. Now, Ann's Place is a cancer support facility in Danbury, Connecticut. And there it works with people who have cancer, 
uh, who have are, are going through the process, have, have conquered it at least for now, and maybe family members of those who have, who have died from cancer. So the client base is changing all the time, and you know, microgreens is great for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, at a time in their lives where they feel that they may not have a lot of control of things, uh, I give them an opportunity to have a, a quick success. Microgreens are also incredibly chock full of vitamins and antitoxins and, and all sorts of great stuff that are healthy. So again, that sort of helps the uh, issue of eating well and feeling better uh, when you have something like cancer. So it really works on a multiple series of levels. And they also get to uh, hang out with other people who are suffering or have suffered the same kind of thing. So they're, they're all this uh, a very, very tightly knit affinity group that are all enjoying being together and doing something that's healthy that they can somewhat control. Yeah, that, you know, what a great experience, what a great lesson for them to learn. Um, we have a few questions, Eric. Um, John, sure. do, you, do you have the questions in front of you? I do. First okay. is a comment from Tony, who is also in Connecticut right now. Mm -hmm. And she says that she's often said that gardening is her therapy. She said when she was working long hours and a very stressful career, that her weekends in the garden helped her cope. And maybe give us a quick comment on that. Oh, that's that's absolutely true. I mean, in, in one of my prior careers, uh, when I was working more in the corporate world, uh, before I even came back and entered the house, if I had a bad day, I would just go out in the garden, I would water, I would weed, and just that ability to, you know, see how things were going, to go and maybe uh, touch something very aromatic like uh, rosemary or lavender and just sort of take in the heady sense of that, to see, uh, to maybe harvest and, and nibble on a fresh asparagus coming up. Uh, just all of those things were, were really calming, and so it took my the intensity of me being like uptight and not a great person <laughs> way down so I could enter and see my family in a way that would be constructive rather than destructive. Well, and I think you just hit it right there is, you know, and, you know, it's not for everybody, but if you can prevent yourself from walking into your home where your kid, you're, you know, and if you have children, because I experienced this, children don't recognize stress in their no. parents, right? So you right. can walk in and you can have had the worst day at work and your kids are going to either come up to you and ask you for something. They might just annoy you in some way or, you know, maybe they're trying to be friendly, but you're just not ready to be friendly yet. But, you know, when you walk in and you don't have that barrier and you walk in there with that stress on your life, that's going to feed off on your kids and you're going to get angry with them. You might, you know, get frustrated with them. But if you can have that moment before you get home where you do something like what we're talking about in the yard then hopefully you walk in the house and you're ready to you know accept whatever it is that they're going to throw well, your well, tiger way. that's why you plant night blooming jasmine right at your front door yeah you take a big whiff <laughs> take before a big you whiff. get into the house <laughs> nice yeah there, so, there are different personalities and, yeah and i always tell my wife that not everyone is as mild-mannered and pleasant to be around as me. You know, so you do have to, to learn how yeah, to work exactly. with other people. Yeah. That's hey, good. we have a, uh, a question from Kim in Tucson. Sure. And uh, she wants to know if you could explain how you become a horticultural therapist. She's thinking of uh, getting a degree in counseling. Right. Well, uh, there's, there's a number of things to do. One, one of the things I first did was I went to and became a master gardener in the state of Connecticut. Now, every state in the United States, as well as I think pretty much every province in Canada, has master gardener programs that are usually work through the uh, university and college extension programs. And if, you've, if you're interested in really learning uh, the nuts and bolts of a widespread of gardening experience, uh, those are great programs. And then on top of that, there's a facility that some of you may have heard of called the New York Botanical Gardens uh, in New York City. And they have a number of educational programs, and they have a program there in a certification in horticultural therapy. And so what, what Master Gardening does is it gives you sort of the nuts and bolts of plants and gardening and all that. What the horticultural therapy program does uh, is give you the ways in which you can use your knowledge of plants to help different people. So you learn how to create classes. You learn how to work on budgets. You learn how to address 
the different issues that people may have. You learn in terms of counseling uh, how to set goals, how to set a program together, and how to measure results. So, you know, all of those things you learn. So there's a couple of different things uh, you have to do before you can, you know, really practice properly uh, horticultural therapy. Now, is that NYBG program online? Can you take that online? Uh, there are online programs you can take. A number of universities offer them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Botanic Gardens, they used to have online stuff. I think they're going more toward, uh, you know, on-site uh, because, again, you know, uh, I've done, I mean, it's amazing. I didn't think during COVID I would be able to continue to have sessions, but after a month or two, I, uh, I said, okay, I, I can't just leave my clients. So I was able to set up, and they are incredible, more effective than I ever would have imagined, uh, Zoom classes uh, for my clients. And, uh, in fact, we'll be coming out of that hopefully, uh, well, no, not hopefully, uh, next month uh, in, in May, we'll be back to on-site classes. But for most of the winter, I've been doing classes and having between 20 and 25 clients uh, in every class. Is that Does that catch us up on all the questions? Well, except we just got another comment from Tony yeah. in Connecticut, and she says, uh, Eric, we have to meet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> she said she's in Westport, and their master gardeners there have an outreach at a senior living center. Uh, which they call the Healing Garden, and she volunteers other places, but this one was uh, always an interesting project. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Eric, we're it's, going to have it to— It sounds great. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally around the corner from Tony, so uh, she should just reach out to me on uh, Facebook or Instagram, and we can uh, we can chat. Yeah, and we're going to have to take a break here in about another 30 seconds again, but when we get back, Eric, I want to talk about this idea of the garden because you mentioned Ann's Place, and mm -hmm. and I know that here in San Diego, I've worked with a few hospitals that have you know cancer areas or um, pediatric wards, and they focus on putting gardens in them specifically for sensory things or healing mm -hmm. aspects, um, and I want to see if you can let our listeners know about how they can get involved in maybe their local regions with some of these uh, programs and gardens. So when we get back, we'll continue chatting with Eric Keller, the author of A Therapist Garden. And again, thank you, Eric. A lot of people, uh, boy, this has touched a nerve with our Facebook uh, viewers, a lot of questions, a lot of comments, and a lot of people tuned in this morning. So thank you. Going to take a very quick break. Uh, Biz Talk Radio Facebook Live. Keep the questions, the comments coming for us, or of course, Eric, our guest this morning here. We're talking uh, garden therapy here on Garden America. Stay with us. Okay, we are back. As you can see, if you're watching us on Facebook Live or at least listening to us and those on BizTalk Radio, BizTalk Radio listeners, our final segment for hour number one with news coming up top of the hour back at six minutes after. And again, as we mentioned, hopefully your market carries either both hours, one or both, uh, one or two, as long as you tune into Garden America, Tiger. <laughs> Definitely. Tune in as much as possible yeah. and join us here on Facebook Live. Uh, we're talking with Eric Keller, the author of A Therapist Garden. Eric is a horticulturalist therapist um and you know before the break eric i was mentioning there's local areas i think primarily where, wherever you live there is probably some kind of garden that has some kind of therapy aspect to it whether it's a sensory or some kind of healing um or just a botanical garden that you can walk through in just a relaxing atmosphere and you mentioned a few that you work with but I wanted to um, kind of see if you had information that you can give to our listeners about maybe how they can get involved in their local regions. Do you do you recommend contacting their local master gardeners, local hospitals? How do you think that the best way to go about it would be? Well, I think you, uh, first of all, if you're interested, you, you need to have a, a real passion about the group that you want to help. So if it's people who are dealing with cancer or if it's veterans, or if it's seniors, or special needs children, um, you know, you, you have to have a passion about that population. And then uh, talk to the local facilities and see if they want to, you know, 
facilitate, fund, work with you to set up uh, a, a little space and then all the way to a large garden. Um, you know, one thing that's important is you need to kind of understand uh, the needs of the individuals that you would want to work with. So the kind of garden that, let's say, you would set up for uh, a nursing facility that had people with severe physical limitations as well as cognitive challenges uh, is going to be very different. Um, You know, there you're going to probably want to set up large benches uh, with things that are maybe very tactile, uh, that they can, you know, like like very uh, aromatic herbs, um, that they can get to in, like, let's say, a wheelchair, whereas if you're working with children, uh, you'd want to have something where they could be a lot more physical. Um, now, by the way, the funny thing is that this doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money, uh, but it does take uh, a reasonable amount of planning because what you want to do is you want to create a place. You never know what's going to, you know, hit somebody's fancy. You know, you, you like when you go into a, a nursery or a big place where you want to buy plants, you're never really sure, unless you go in there with an agenda, what is going to hit you. Uh, I know that's at least the way I am whenever <laughs> I walk into a big place. Uh, so what you want to do is create lots of different things that will stimulate different people in different ways. And that's, you know, along all the senses. Uh, you know, you want things that are going to smell interesting. You want things that are tactile that you can touch. You want things that are going to look pretty, you know, things you can maybe taste, and even things that you can hear. And so if you create spaces with the engagement of those five senses, uh, and it's focused at the population you're working with, you can't lose. Everyone's going to be a winner. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, you mentioned it's not very expensive. And I want to hit on that a little bit because I think the, the thing with gardens isn't the initial expense because there's so many grants, so many programs out there that help people initially get started. It's the kind of aftercare, the maintenance, the the, the the taking care of it afterwards, which is the difficult thing, because, you know, for, for anybody that is interested in getting some kind of a, a therapy garden, I know that the uh, Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts specifically, they have to do programs locally within their communities. And a lot of times they will pick to do a garden where, you know, they can build and construct and work with someone on that. And they get a lot of donations from a lot of local nurseries and garden centers Um, to do it so it's not always the initial it's the afterwards like you're saying taking care of the the plants keeping them up and Mm -hmm. um, keeping the people that you're working with engaged in the actual garden itself so um you know yeah lots of lots of good good options there um you know we all know that nature is a great therapist in its own way do you find with what you're working with right now eric Um, you know, one of the things I feel in Southern California here specifically is a lot of our schools are doing away with green areas. You know, they, they want to fence everything in and, you know, pave it. They don't want to have to maintain it. Like we're talking about, how about there in Connecticut? Are the schools still very green? Do they have a lot of opportunity? I feel like kids can learn better in that environment. Well, and they are. And in fact, uh, in the town I live in, uh, which is Ridgefield, as well as a lot of surrounding towns. Uh, there's a lot of uh, gardens and green space that's being created, uh, not just like vegetable gardens, but also uh, flower and sensory gardens to attract uh, native pollinators. So there's a big move in a lot of places in Connecticut to basically bring back more green uh, so that uh, kids can get a better appreciation of things. And again, the schools and areas can support the, uh, the local uh, animals and insects and birds. No, oh, that's that's really awesome to hear. I'm so glad to hear that. Hey, Tiger, we have a quick comment for, just to show how universal uh, and relaxing gardening can be. Is a uh, listener in Karachi, Pakistan, it says that she's uh, also feels free from stress when she's looking after her plants. She says she feels like she's taking care of her children. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a responsibility. Yeah, right, right. And then we also have a listener in Calcutta, India, who says that uh, she's gardening on her rooftop. Oh, that's see, it could be done yeah. anywhere, right? Yeah. Anywhere. Eric, you're hitting a worldwide audience this morning, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, I guess the, in India right now, it must be fairly late at night. <laughs> yeah, we're we're at one of the more popular evening shows over there. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
You know, but uh, back to the book, Eric, you know, I want to lay it out. So you create little lessons also for people to be able to use from this book um, and kind of, you know, lay it out that like, you know, you know, a seed starting lesson, like you mentioned the microgreens, um, you know, so you've kind of created this whole 12 month plan. If so, so do you think you kind of created this guide for people that are trying to kind of become horticultural therapists? And we have about a minute, so I might cut you off in the middle of your explanation. Sorry. All right. Well, I think uh, I'll, I'll do it fast. Yeah, it is for uh, you know potentially people who want to enter uh, this kind of profession or practice, but it's also for just anybody who wants to enjoy plants and you know giving everybody the opportunity to look at every month as something that they can engage nature in versus hide from it. Uh, and, and I think that's an important thing because I think regardless of where you live, uh, you can engage with plants and nature and gardening year round. Awesome. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll wrap up talking with Eric Keller, the author of A Therapist's Garden. And those on uh, Biz Talk Radio, again, thank you for tuning in. This is last week's show pre-recorded, but we do appreciate you being there. Uh, you've got news coming up top of the hour, and again, hopefully you carry hour number two. Six minutes after is when we return on uh, Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live even quicker. So do stay with us as we continue and wrap things up with Eric on the other side here on Garden America. Well, for some of you, it is um, Saturday afternoon. Maybe it's uh, Saturday evening in the middle of your weekend because we are hitting a worldwide audience. So thank you for tuning in. Those on Biz Talk Radio, however you hear us, we appreciate it. Those on the Facebook Live, you can actually watch, interact live here. So again, if you'd like to, um, if you're listening, let's say on the radio or wherever streaming, you can tune in on the West Coast every uh, Saturday morning, 8.06, Eastern Time Zone, 11.06. Interact with us live on Facebook Live. Tiger, John, Brian, Maine, here we are on Saturday with uh, Eric and again talking about uh, therapy as, in terms of, of gardening and how you can apply it to be something positive in your life, Tiger. Yeah, and, you know, Eric Keller, the author of uh, Therapist Garden, uh, has been joining us this morning. And I just wanted to mention his website, growhappy.com, G-R-O, happy.com, also has a, a whole series of different, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe post, blog post. Um, on this idea of kind of therapist garden keeps everybody in the loop and also a great way to be able to get a hold of his book, a therapist garden. Um, so, um, Eric, you know, on your website, you know, I see that you have, you know, the different posting postings, um, that you're going to continue to doing Is there another book in the works or are you just happy with the one at the moment? That's I, I have a couple of other ideas. Uh, I'm still getting through this. Uh, <laughs> writing a book uh, is a uh, is a long term exercise, yeah. uh, and I enjoyed it. I'm I'm happy that a lot of people are enjoying the book right now. But yeah, no, I, I do have some other things that I'm uh, planning to do. Hopefully, and uh, yeah, I do plan to keep posting. I post on you know Instagram and Facebook almost daily, uh, some sort of gardening or horticultural therapy issue, and uh, those are also reflected on my website. I'm sure it was hard because, as I mentioned, this book is filled of like real life scenarios that you have worked through. Um, I'm sure it was hard over the 20 years of doing, you know, this work that you compiled it down to just what you put in the book, right? Well, yeah, you you want to have things that are different. Uh, you want to have things that are are interesting. I mean, the the challenge was sort of winnowing it down so that you have a, a broad breadth of experiences and things that people will like. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're, you know, doing these jobs or, or any job, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, there's sparks that happen and then sometimes there's not. And, you know, the sparks are best captured in my book. All right. Well, I did post the link to your website, growhappy.com. Again, G-R-O, mm -hmm. happy.com. Uh, Eric, I want to thank you very much for yeah. joining us this morning. Lots of great information. Um, you know, listeners out there, if you're interested in the book, go to his website. You can order it straight from there. 
And um, if you're in Connecticut, you can look for Eric and get a hold of him on social yeah. media. You might be able to meet up at one of the uh, gardens, right? That's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, I am, I am actually doing a speaking engagement at Ann's Place on uh, April the 5th, I believe, which is a uh-huh. Tuesday. So if anybody's local and want to hear me talk about the book and meet me, feel free to come by. Perfect. Excellent. Well, Eric, thank you very much for joining us. Take care. Stay warm. I know you still have a little bit of cool weather ahead, but um, spring is right around the corner for you guys. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. You bet. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye. I would say that touched a very positive nerve with our listeners and viewers this morning based on the, the feedback and comments. Definitely. I mean, you know, the the idea of using plants as therapy is always it's, – it's nothing that's necessarily new – but I think people don't always understand how much it actually does. Right. You know, yesterday, I, I was off work, and things needed to be done. Patio swept. Um, watering needed to be done. Raking needed to be done. I, not only did I look forward to it, that satisfaction afterwards. You kind of walk back outside, take a look, fold your arms, and look around and go, yeah, I did that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a goofy movie. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's called, I think, Evan Almighty. You know, it's got a uh, Morgan Freeman in it, and he plays God, I think. And there's a portion of the movie where he's mopping a floor, and um, I think Jim Carrey is Jim the, Carrey was the, the main character, the counter, right? right? Right. And he gets a chance to be God, and you yeah, know, yeah. he's like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Well, you know, he's mopping the floor," and and you know, at the end of it, he's like, "Why do you do this?" And he's like, "Well, I it's nice to finish something." And, you know, when you can look back and you can see right, what you've right. done and mm-hmm. what you worked on and then – and that's that's gardening. And, and it might not always be finished, as, you know, John mentioned. You know, we're always out there doing something new. At night when we go to sleep, we're always thinking about what we're going to work on next. But walking around and trimming a plant or weeding an area, there is that sense of accomplishment, which gives you so much uh, positive feelings in your life. Right. That it's it's hard to get that from a lot of other things. As and I mentioned, kids, you know, that's a long term right. sense of accomplishment. And it's very it is very therapeutic. But the one thing I've learned about gardening is you're never done. Yeah. Now you may have a project where you finish the project, but mm-hmm. you're not done because that project requires maintenance. Yeah. You you have to care for it. You know, it's it's yeah. never done. I think yeah. John is a good example of that. He he's you're still never is, done. Yeah, he still is going. And he'll keep going. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, this is so funny, we were at Disneyland, and I was very small, and we were on the monorail, and over the loudspeaker, they're talking about how Disneyland was built and the projects, and they said, but of course, Disneyland will never be finished or done. And as a kid, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I'm looking at it, it's done to me, it's, it's finished, well, I don't understand what you mean, and the point was, our projects continue, we yeah. will grow, we'll become even more contemporary, we will learn things, and gardening is the same way. It's just, you know, you're not the same gardener you were today as maybe a year ago, yeah. six months ago. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. And I, I always tell people, you know, your garden is like your wardrobe. If, if your garden is the same garden from back in the 60s, you know, and your wardrobe is the same as it was back in the 60s, you, you know, you're, you're living in, a, you know, a time warp. But, you know, people change over the years and they change their garden. Well, John still wears the same rose underwear that he's had for, gosh, I don't know how many years. A bit uncomfortable because of the thorns, but, you know, he puts up with it. Don't you love the way we just talk about him? He's, he's, he's not, not even, even here. Like I'm not even here. Right, exactly. You know, I can't remember who, who had the quote, but there was that co- quote that a finished garden is, is a dead garden. Yeah. You know how true. Yeah. yeah. Because if it's, yeah. otherwise it's always evolving. Hey, one of our listeners, um, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, it's uh, Salisu uh, in Nigeria, says that he agrees with us that gardening's the best therapy. He said the small orchard in his house provides him with some shade and, and fresh uh, fruits, and mm-hmm. it's a uh, tremendous aid to him in his old age uh uh in grace and vitality (laughs) so we appreciate that comment and we appreciate you tuning in and listening to us because you know the way we speak of gardening and and the way that he speaks of gardening although one and the same can also be very different depending upon lifestyle and circumstances yes definitely and did 
John, you had something else? Well, it's just Kevin uh, commented that his motto in his garden is, if it ain't beautiful, healthy, or tasty, it's out of here. <laughs> Kevin is an old go. friend of mine from a there long time ago. Kevin, we love you. Thank you for uh, watching and tuning in. My friend, have you noticed that you have a lot more old friends than, than you used to have? <laughs> than young friends? <laughs> yeah, but as you get older, you have less old friends, right? Oh goodness, <laughs> different, different old. Um, you know, we we kind of touched on this when talking with Eric a little bit, and Eric, I I meant to bring it up a little bit more was he worked with some people in a juvenile detention facility, <clears throat> and you know, you mentioned the the listener from Nigeria, and I I feel like he was hitting on the idea of beautification around you, you know, mm -hmm. being able to walk outside right. and, and have that. And I feel one of the worst things we do as a society, and, and maybe it's just Southern California because of our water situation, you know, maybe areas that get more water and greener, it's different. But the worst thing we do as a society is in some of our facilities, whether it's a detention facility or a school, which is even worse in my eyes, we kind of eliminate that greenery. Because it's hard to maintain, it's hard to keep up, the water bills yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah, right. But it creates that void of of that life. And it's not just the plants, it's the birds, it's the hummingbirds, it's everything around you. You know what and, it does? It represents hope. Yeah, and you know, I just feel like we're 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 moving in the wrong direction when we do that to A, you know, any kind of school, but B, if it is a detention facility. They need, they're, they're perpetuating a problem. And they need that. Yeah. They need the green. They need the, you know, giving somebody a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that in some prisons they allow cats, you know, pet programs because mm -hmm. it gives them, you know, something. Those are to, called zoos. Uh, are you are talking those zoos? About, yeah, the, where they've got the tigers and the lions behind bars. I better go back and reread that book then. I, I was, I'm totally <laughs> off base. Hey, that said, though, John chimes in just in time. It is time for yet another break here as we continue. Now, those on Facebook Live, questions, comments, whatever you want to talk about, discuss, let us know because we are here for you as we continue on Biz Talk Radio and Facebook Live right here on Garden America. Well, the mics are hot, which means we're on the air. We are in uh, the uh, beautiful iHeart Studios, iHeart Media and Entertainment in San Diego, California, broadcasting every week as we get together with you, Facebook Live, BizTalk Radio, and however you may be listening to us, whatever digital platform you have, streaming, so many ways to listen and to see us. And, of course, uh, remember our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio. Like, subscribe, and share. It's been John's motto for years before YouTube, Tiger. <laughs> Has it been? You know, our uh, Idaho contingent, see, uh, Gina mentions that there's a reason that so many people turn to gardening during COVID. You know, she she's right, too. Because it was therapy for a lot right. of people. I mean, new people and even, even who never gardened before and those that did garden. And and we talked about how successful we thought, oh, after COVID, our garden center is going to suffer or, you know, what's right. going to happen. And actually, it was the other way. It was the opposite. Yeah. There, there was a, a, a surge, right? Right, Exactly. And then Rick in Star Idaho mentioned that gardening gives people a sense of purpose. It's something mm -hmm. that you're responsible for, something you need to do. As a matter of fact, now that I think about it, you know, one of my favorite books, The Little Prince. Yeah. Um, did you read that book to your yeah. kids? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, he was gardening on a little tiny planet. Exactly. And all he had was one rose bush. Right. But it gave him a, a sense of purpose. It was something to do every day. Every something day. he had to take care of. Yeah. No, it's so true. And I and even before I knew anything about gardening, I'd buy a home and the first thing I'd do is go down to Home Depot. Get a ficus benjamina. Get a ficus benjamina. <laughs> and I didn't even there were no, no SUVs back then. I didn't have a truck. I had like a four door car. And I'd be stuffing all these things in the car. I don't know how I did it. I got him in the car. Came home, knew not what I was doing, planted them, a little bit of fertilizer, a little bit of water. And then one day, after working with Bruce Asakawa, I was kind of bragging to Bruce about how much I was doing. He goes, well, yeah, but now you know a little bit. Now you're dangerous. Yeah. Now you've learned a little bit to be dangerous. You know? Well, it's like those people who place bets and have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. And they it's win. Better, it's better to be that than right? to. Right? And those yeah. people that have all this knowledge and they lose. Exactly. But, yeah, the point is, it's just, it is therapeutic. It is, it's just a... 
it's just a great thing to get into and do. And I think that should be taught in schools at a very young age. Well, it, it is amazing, you know, as John mentioned, the connection that you can have with something so so little or so simple, but you feel that responsibility. Meaning, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I come from a garden center family, mm-hmm. so plants are a blessing to me. And don't get me wrong, like I do love plants. You weren't but, forced into it, though, were you? I, no, I was not. You, you were born into it, and it was your choice. And it was my choice. So it is. I, I, it is nothing I was forced into. But at the same time, you know, for me, and I think for some, like you say, you're you're just dangerous enough. For me, if I lose a plant, it's, I, I don't think it's as big a deal. No, not you know, There are some no. plants that maybe, you know, like John mentioned, uh, lemon chiffon, you know, rose. When you mm-hmm. lost that, it, it hurt you. It was frustrating. Did, did you go to the wake? Well, well, it didn't hurt me as much because <laughs> they were just cuttings, and I never actually had it. Had, but had I had a plant and it, killed it. That would have been different. But, it, but right. nonetheless, that struck you more than a... A Chrysler Imperial or something else, right? right you know, right. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know that plants come and go, you know. But you know, someone also, I mean, I, I've known people that have come into the garden center and they've devastated. brought their plant and they are just devastated. And it's just a simple plant in my eyes, but to them, it was their child, it was their pet, it was what it was. And they are just devastated over the loss of this. And I'm like sitting there thinking, like, just buy a new one and start over again. And but you know what? Though? That's okay. They want to save it. They feel like that's passion. It is. But and that's ha- good. What they have to learn is don't lose the passion. We appreciate how much this means to you. However, yeah. and that however can be, you know what? But maybe get another plant or uh, you did it. You know, sometimes you can do everything right. Yeah. And a plant is still going to die. But it gave them that responsibility yes. every day. That and gave them good. the purpose to to wake up. That gave them the purpose to do what mm-hmm. they did every day with that. And, you know, back to this therapy thing, that for people that maybe are lacking some of that purpose, what a great way to hopefully introduce it to them to give them that sense of responsibility, that purpose. Absolutely. Um, and then real quick, I want to touch because, you know, John's quote from Monty Don, I follow him on uh, social media. And believe it or not, he does post a lot about gardening, Mm -hmm. but it's even more about life. You know, I think his dog, I think it's only one dog now, has more posts than plants. (laughs) And and it's because he talks about how, you know, his life is, it's it's more about like his helping through life than gardening. Well, I was thinking about your comment on some of the schools in San Diego and how they were taking away the landscapes. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, the worst thing about that is that it's teaching our children that this is acceptable. Yeah. 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 And it's not. And it's not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And water, you know, I'm sorry, and I know a lot of people will disagree with me, but water is not a problem in California. Yeah. Never has been. No, we make it a problem. We make it a problem. Make it a pro- that's exactly right. And if if we wanted uh, more water, we could build more reservoirs. And it's just what there, there's ways to get water. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, San Diego County fortunately has no water problems. And uh, yeah, the yeah, other right parts do. And and I mean, and when it comes to these gardens, you know, like you say, like water. Okay, fine. You know, we have like reclaimed sources for water. And, exactly. we, and we're not allowed to use that water for ourselves. So right. why not plant? Why not use that at a school garden? We have a whole ocean out there. <laughs> that's <laughs> just take too. the salt out of it yeah. and use the water. So, like so yeah, they do I mean, in Carlsbad. You know, I, I wonder if down the road we will realize what we're actually doing for our children is way more harmful than you know what we right. could be doing because right. of what we're creating. Yeah, yeah. I didn't that's realize why they call it a concrete jungle. I didn't realize that you're. Uh, your buddy Kevin was in Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, on Wednesday we were talking to our financial advisor on a video conference from Coeur d'Alene. Really? Yeah, he had just moved there. Where's uh, that? It's at the uh, northern end of Idaho, oh. right near the Canadian border. Yeah, right? it's uh, yeah. It's up. Is it spelled just like the plant? Or the, how do you spell Coeur d'Alene? Oh, Idaho. not Coeur d'Alene. You're thinking no. of Coeur d'Alene? Yeah. No. Uh, Coeur d'Alene. Right. Coeur d'Alene, yeah. Coeur d'Alene is C-O-U-E-R-D apostrophe. Are you really? Yeah. Oh, it's like a French word, yeah. right? Yeah. Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking Coeur d'Alene like the plant. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but he was, uh, our advisor was telling us about 
how cold it actually gets up there and how much snow. Because Gina lives in in Meridian, which is right near Boise, and they it's the banana belt. They have no snow, yeah. uh, you know, occasionally, but it'll last a day or two, and that's about it. And Enough to have fun, but then not enough to right have it quarter lane it snows and sticks <laughs> <laughs> yeah feet of snow he said that um his driveway is right now under four inches of ice <laughs> oh goodness he says yeah he says uh i didn't realize i shouldn't have bought a house on the north side of a mountain <laughs> oh goodness <laughs> so and you know what just, just in our, our trip last december as we attempted to to meet up with my son in cheyenne driving through utah and and uh, wyoming with the heavy snow and then to get out and look at the condition of my car, and I'm thinking, boy, the people that live here, yeah, it, that that weather beats up cars big time, big right. time. Hey, it is break time. We have two more segments. Let's get going, people. Those on Facebook Live, questions, comments, what's happening? Again, we're here for the next, uh, I don't know, half hour or so. Two more segments. Going to take a break for Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live, and as they say in radio, back after these messages. But only if you're tuned in on Biz Talk Radio. Ah, uh, yes, we have returned simply by turning on the mics. We're back because we never went any place. We're right here. We're not, we don't leave during you know the break. We're here. Sometimes we do. Sometimes uh, occasionally you know, you might need to walk out real quick. Occasionally, yeah. So here we are with uh, boy. We've been talking about the therapy garden this morning. Eric was a Eric was a really good guest, and again, he touched a lot of positive yeah. nerve with the uh, nerves. I should say with people. I wasn't sure about that topic. Uh, I what, know. I thought the same thing. Yeah, and I was wondering. Do I really, really want to drive all the way to San Diego for this? <laughs> but I'm glad I did. No, it was good. I think I, we uh, were all well, surprised in a very positive way. I, I have a question for John. I know the answer from Brian is yes. But, John, even if it's in your head, do you ever find yourself talking to your plants? Because I know Brian does. Yeah, I do. You do. Let's I, go, guys. I, Brian, Come on. Yeah. You're not feeling good? What are you doing, huh? You need some water? Exactly. You know, there was a... Um, there was uh, a writer, a gardener, uh, I think he was associated with Kmart back in the 60s, and he wrote a book called Plants Are Like People. Mm -hmm. His name was Jerry Baker. And he was the first one who came up with uh, popularizing talk to your plants. <laughs> and that if you talk to your plants, and there was even a... A, an album that came out that was music for your well, plants. We, music we, for plants to grow by. They Do you know that, that certain music, they played rock music yeah. as opposed to classical yeah, done music. Research, right. Yeah. right. Yeah, but this was a whole album just for you to, to play for your plants. But anyway, so it was kind of a big thing back then. If you talk to your plants, you know, they'll grow better. And, um, and my grandmother grew all kinds of house plants, and she was a, a gardener, and, you know, I. As a kid, I would walk her rose garden with her, and I think that's how I first learned to, to really like roses. But anyway, when this came out, I was talking to my grandmother one day, and she was showing me a gardenia. And people in Michigan always tried to grow gardenias as houseplants, and they just did not do well. The buds, would, the buds would come out, and then they'd fall off. Yeah. They'd never open up. So anyway, uh, I was over there um, talking to my grandmother, and I said, well, Grandma, she was telling me how disappointed she was. She couldn't get these the plant <laughs> to open up the blooms. So I said, Grandma, you've got to talk to it. And she looked at me, and I said, no, really. They're saying now that if you talk to your plants, they'll do better. And you're how old about? What are you? Oh, I was, I was uh, like 17, 18 oh, okay. at okay. the time. Yeah. So... She looked at me skeptically, and, um, you know, she was from Italy, so she wanted to make sure she understood what I was saying because <laughs> it made no sense. But a month later, I went over there, and on her kitchen counter was this gardenia with probably about a dozen blooms wide really? open on it. And I said, uh, I said, Grandma, I said, look at that gardenia. Did you talk to it? She goes, yeah. And I go, well, what did you say? I, I said, if you don't grow and bloom, I'm going to throw you out in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And did you speak to it in English or Italian? I don't know. Universal. But, but it matter. understood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Straighten up and fly right. But but I feel like I feel like even more than for the plants, it's for us that you know when I'm out, I know I know when I'm out there in my yard, I'll find myself 
Come on, like, guys. Like, like, yeah, doing? like, you know, what's going on over here? Why why is this happening? And, you know, I'll, I'll find myself. And, you know, and, you know, it's just for us to kind of feel like there's that connection. With you know, I um, have had two hibiscus plants for about two or three years. And um, I have finally come to the conclusion that I am losing one of them. What? One that I gave you? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, they were both side by side, doing very well. I moved them to a different location, doing well, same care. And one started to have a little more leaf drop than I thought was normal. HB 101, little fertilizer, didn't overwater it. But I've watched this very slow progression. And finally yesterday, because it still had some, some leaves on it, it looked viable. And then yesterday I realized that this was it. That oh, yeah. This is it. Now, the good news is I will gain another pot from this. Yeah. For something else to move into. Way to, way to look on the good side of it, Brian. And in fact, in fact, one of the tomato plants you brought in, I think, we'll may get that there. pot. But, yeah, there's a sense of loss. But yeah. I did everything I could. And it's nice to have two of them of the same. Because, well, he lived. Why couldn't you live? Mm-hmm. You know, but that's just uh, that's the way it goes. And I, I always it. used to ask you how plants I gave you were doing. And then I realized I don't have to ask because if you don't tell me, yeah. it's dead. That, that, that's why... <laughs> You know, this is interesting because I started to tell this story thinking John wouldn't chime in or have any, you know, association with that. And then he said, you mean the ones I gave you? Yes, exactly. And then I was stuck. I had, well, to, I had to admit it. I mean, let's be but real. But the other one is beautiful. It's totally- on, your, on your patio, what percentage of plants did John give you? Right now, I've got a huge, huge palm. I've got the... Um, what's Not the that t- many. Maybe what, 20%. Oh, what, what's the tongue? Ox Mud. tongue. Ox tongue. Oh, the, yeah. ox tongue. Um, the hibiscus. The hibiscus. You got bananas. Roses. Roses. Oh, the roses. Yeah, you're probably, you know what? No, it's probably closer to 35%. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And he is right about not saying anything if something dies. But I will say that out of all, I lose maybe maybe 5%. Maybe <laughs> 5%. I've got I've got plants that have been in there 12, 13, 14 years. I I was at this yard working on this woman was having her backyard redone and we're planting it. And before we started planting, she had her gardener clear it so that way we could plant it right. from a fresh slate. But she had her gardener keep everything. So we were talking ivy geraniums and just just stuff that again, I'm like, why would you even bother? But again, she has this connection, and she now now that it's done, she wants to put this stuff back into where we can. And I'm just, and I'm thinking like, just why? Like, you know, if, <laughs> if you know, you had this new design done. Yeah, we, yeah. We did not plant ivy geraniums because that wasn't really the, the design we were going for. So why are you reintroducing? And it's just funny because she she can't throw it away. And I'm, but meanwhile, I'm over there just like throwing these away. <laughs> like, don't go back. Learning to let go. Yeah. Here's a, a good comment from Lisa when we're talking about talking to your plants. She says that I find myself apologizing a lot to them. <laughs> yeah. oh, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I neglected you. Yeah, I know. The, you were out I in the should've. sun about an hour too long. Yeah. I know. It's going to be okay. I, I, I am doing an <clears> experiment. <throat> there's the orange juice, and then there's the Chrysler Imperial Rose that I got from uh, the orange juice I got from the auction and the Chrysler Imperial from John. Orange juice should have bloomed now. Oh, it's, it's always, one of the first roses I, to I, bloom every year. I'm not year. blooming. I'm not trimming them. Wh- which one is so that? I'm really? seeing what happens with uh-huh. them. Which one is that? Orange juice. Okay. And then okay. a Chrysler so Imperial. So you're going to let it go like it was out in the wild? Yes. Sure. I'm seeing just what will happen to them both. Be fine. Without pr- pruning them. Um, oh. I just let it. I let it go wild. Because if you clip off the old blooms, you get more. You'll get more. No, and I, but I'm just kind of have this experiment to He's see what He's it, pretending like it's in a cemetery. Exactly. No and and it, it's doing spectacular. So um, it's a really neat plant. And then the Chrysler Imperial is probably seven feet tall. It is really tall. Now, that said, aesthetically, it probably doesn't look as good as it might. No. That's not the point, right? But no, it's, yeah. But I have them in this area, and they have the backdrop of the hedge, and um yeah so, so the condition fits the the scenery that you have going oh right? yeah yeah oh yeah yeah it's pretty cool i i, I like them i like the way that they're growing <laughs> i like <laughs> it that's what i'm gonna do yeah i don't care what anybody else thinks i like it yeah 
Oh, we caught up, John. Uh, we've got. Well, some, Gina yeah. says that she used to talk to an orchid that she got as a teenager, and that orchids. I told her orchids don't like that much attention, and she says, "Sure enough, I overloved it, and it died." <laughs> orchids are like cats to me. They're they're they like they want you to see them but then they don't want you to, to touch, touch them, them or <laughs> like they, <laughs> they, want, they want attention when they want it yes i'm exactly. like a dog who's it, ready to give you attention all the time all the time right? every day all and day who's appreciative yeah. i am fully convinced with yeah. our three cats that that they think they own the place yes that we're just there as a guest to serve them right i'm totally convinced of that and that's what an orchid is to me you know we have one of our cats because we have dry food out there you know during the day besides the wet food they get and all he has to do, if he doesn't like it, is to, to walk in the kitchen. He sits down with his back to us and just stares at that food. And you do something for and him. And he's like, I don't, this is not to my liking. I need yeah. this changed. No, you know what? That's what you're going to eat. And eventually, maybe <laughs> he'll go over. But this is just this staring yeah. into this food with just this disdain. disgust and disdain. <laughs> now, the opposite of that is chickens. Oh gosh! Because right. you throw out some treats for them, and they just go they crazy. So appreciative. It's like, we we haven't eaten in months. It's we're so happy. Thank you for thinking of us. Hey, that's going to do it for this segment. One more segment coming up until we say bye bye for a week. So do stay with us, those on Biz Talk Radio. We have to keep on time for the network, and to those on the Facebook Live, messages on Biz Talk Radio back even quicker on Facebook Live. Stay with us. All righty, here we go. This is our uh, final segment on your Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, or perhaps you're listening or watching this replay, so time wouldn't matter. Uh, but we are going to wrap things up here in about seven minutes. Uh, hopefully you've had a good weekend so far. You had a good week, and a fantastic week lies ahead. We have rain in the forecast here in San Diego. Do you, do you still have your chickens, John? Well, I remember. Do I remember? If I, I, can't, I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, just they're Jesse's actually, because right. they were Joe's they were and Joe's, Michelle's, yeah. And, yeah. and Jesse inherited them. But he gets plenty of eggs every day. So but he, when I go down to water the roses, they see me coming. And they and, get excited. Yeah, and they know. Yeah, yeah, huh? And I said, "All right, guys, I'll give you a treat." Go but, in but, there. but you know, it's super funny. Um, and this kind of goes with gardening. Is the other thing too. What's fun to do if you if you do own chickens, it is fun to find bugs in the garden if you can. And to right. feed them snail the, the or slug. That's or, like a treat, huh? Even or, earwigs yeah. and sow bugs. Yes. they'll eat them. Yeah. And I mean, if you're lucky enough to find like a grasshopper or something too, oh my that you God. could catch and maybe break a leg off right. or something too. Dinner. They they get so excited yeah. when they, they get do. those into their coop or. You know, there's a there's a guy on on YouTube who has a channel and he's a a hornet bee exterminator. Uh -huh. So he goes in at just these, you know, even more than bees, just, man, you think, how can you, these things are just horrible, you know, big hornets, and he's in Ugh. there, and he's cleaning out, you know, people's gutters and taking down the nests. What he does, he takes home the larva and some of these dead, you know, bodies, uh -huh. and his chickens go wild. Oh yeah, he throws them into this coop, and they just like, yeah, like the John was saying, yeah. it's like a party. He, they just love it, yeah. and all that protein and everything. A caterpillar, you give a, a like a good juicy tomato hornworm to a I chicken was coop. Say a tomato I, hornworm. I it, I envision that that scene from when orca whales are playing with that seal. Yes, the sea lion. Yeah, on the know, little iceberg. That yeah, will... exactly. Oh, hey, uh, Carla has a question from last week. All She's right, been waiting a whole week to ask us, and she wants to know what to give baby blueberry plants to feed the roots, boost the roots a little bit. Okay. Some HB 101, liquid kelp. A little bit of HB 101 once a month mixed with your water-soluble fertilizer, I think, is a good thing. It's probably never a bad time to apply HB 101. Right. And liquid kelp could be used every two weeks, yeah. really. So um, that's a good idea. Might not also be a bad idea to add a little bit of cotton seed meal. Yeah, I was going to say the to pH. Keep, keep the soil, yeah, acid. Yeah. Because that'll because, help. Because I have seen that firsthand where I've just fertilized blueberries with just 
mill organite or regular fertilizer right. and i've seen a decline yeah because of that so it is it, you know and obviously every place is different and if you have it in a pot and you've used a camellia mix that gives you a longer period of time to not right. have to you know change the ph of the soil but if it's in the ground i have failed before by not adding you know the cottonseed right. meal to it because it is important for them to keep that balance all right, uh, Tiger, Darlene wants to know, is there anything that she can, an instrument to put in the ground around a tree to see how much moisture is there? Yeah. She said, despite the deep planting hole and amendments, the clay's really deep and it doesn't drain. Okay. Um, now, this was for a tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know what's, you know what's so funny um, is that I have a friend who owns a vineyard up in Madeira, which is kind of near the Fresno area. And just this week, he posted a posting. He posts on his vineyard and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And he posted a video of him installing different soil moisture sensors in his vineyard. And he installs one at one foot, one at two feet, and one at three feet. So he knows where the water is for his grapes. And, you know, so if you want to go pretty extreme, Hunter irrigation products have moisture meters that are designed for orchards and they go down deep and they're easy to use and they connect via, you know, you know, cables, but they also connect via Bluetooth to kind of measure. And the company is Hunter? Hunter. Okay. Yeah. And we need to let people know, you, you just said moisture meters. And normally when you use that term, yeah. you're thinking about the moisture meters for house plants. Yeah. Yeah. Those you, little teeny little things. Those do not work outdoors. You really no. need a tensiometer. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's what you're describing as a tensiometer. But, I, you know, I've, I've grown thousands and thousands of plants my whole life without a moisture meter yeah i mean even with clay i mean if it's a tree in the soils you know holding water there's probably not much you need to do you know if it's a smaller mm -hmm. plant house it's gonna plant be fine. or whatever my yeah. finger yeah you know it's yeah, okay yeah and like you say if it's clay it's holding water right. it's holding once, water yeah and the roots do grow through right. it. people think oh like you know and, and it's true to some and rather extent than digging a hole why not just get a shovel and and I mean, rather than using a, a tensiometer, why not mm -hmm. just get a shovel and dig a little hole and see, a, is it moist there? Yeah, yeah. No, it, there's a lot of easy ways to do it. But there are products, if she wanted to, right. that are designed more for that. Um, but again, and, and what I was getting at is definitely not using the, you know, Home Depot box store right. moisture meters. They won't do anything. You need to go to an irrigation supply store and look for a tensiometer um, from a, a brand like Rainbird or Hunter, um, and that'll help you out. But for the most part, um, as John mentioned, the I think fertilizing and then using things like HB 101 or, you know, we've talked about soil, um, uh, John and Bob's soil optimizer. If you're having issues with a tree that's or, or shrub that's not going into clay well, or, ha or struggling with water, those are going to be better for mm -hmm. the tree than anything. Because even even if you figure out it's too wet or too dry, that's hard to control with a in-the-ground plant because of right. rain and all of that. Where if you amend the soil with the soil optimizer or you know products that help with the soil, down the road that tree is going to be much healthier because it can survive a, a, a rainstorm or a dry spell. We have just less than uh, 60 seconds. John, did you want to wrap things up with something? Well, yeah, it's our listener in Pakistan wanted some homemade hints on uh, how to grow lots of flowers on their plants. Mm. And uh, they right now they just have leaves. But uh, a homemade idea would be to use, um, oh, what's the disinfectant? Lysol? No, no, no. The uh, H2O2. Hydrogen peroxide. Oh, yeah, oh, hydrogen peroxide. peroxide. Yeah, uh, when you go to fertilize your plants, use some hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. And if you Google hydrogen peroxide for plants on the internet, it'll it will tell you how to mix that up. Different recipes. Yeah, okay. that's a, that's a good idea. We have to bail quickly up against the clock. Thank you so much, those on Biz Talk Radio Facebook Live. We really appreciate it. Our listenership is up. Let's continue to grow. We've got our uh, YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. We've got uh, our website, Garden America Radio. Right. Yeah. At yeah, www. 
www.gardenamerica.com. You don't need the triple W's. You'll find it. For the entire crew, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox, Fox, John Begnasco. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a great week, and we'll do it again next week right here on Garden America. Be safe and take care.